Hi, good morning. I tried to convince some of you to come to the front, but no one listened to me. Actually, the first two rows are completely empty. Oh, Jonathan's going to come up? No? It's, it's economy plus seating. Right, yeah. <laughs> Um, good morning. First, I just wanted to remind everybody that we're governed by the antitrust rules that are sitting in front of you. Um, also, if you have cell phones, please either turn them off or put them on vibrate. That would be great. I hope everyone's enjoying the convention so far. Thank you for having us, Isri. Um, happy to be here. And thanks for coming to Creating Value from Plastic Scrap Quality and Contamination Issues. My name is Maite Quinn. I'm with Sims Municipal Recycling. It's a division of Sims Metal Management. Um, and before I introduce our speakers, I'm just going to tell you briefly about uh, what Sims Municipal Recycling does to deal with quality. So Sims, first of all, is a division of Sims Metal Management. About 10 years ago, uh, we entered into an agreement with New York City to do all of their metal, glass, and plastics. And as part of that agreement, um, we actually agreed to building the largest commingled facility in North America. Um, there's some pictures and renderings. It's actually opening up this summer in August. We've been working on it for over five years because we were working with the city and partnered with them to, to actually build this. Um, we're also going to have an education center there that's going to be teaching about 17,000 students um, a year about recycling. And it's on an 11-acre site in Sunset Park, Brooklyn. Um, it's truly a state-of-the-art facility. It has about 16 optical sorters. And why 16 optical sorters? Well, because this is what we get in New York City. This is the metal, glass, and plastic. This is how it comes in. So obviously, this is not quality that we would be sending anywhere. <laughs> I don't think Stephanie would be very happy to see this just bailed and brought over. So this is another picture of it. So there's a lot of plastic bags and miscellaneous material and plastic bags are a huge problem um, in the, the stream. And so we have, um, we actually have a lot of ballistic separators, trommels, and then the optical sorters. And the optical sorters actually um, shoot out positively. We do PET, polypropylene, HDPE, and PET. And then after that, they're shot out positively. We actually have other optical sorters after that to make sure the quality is still there. And then after that, we have manual sorters. So we do a lot to clean up our product. And this is finally what our product looks like. So it looks a lot different than what you saw in the beginning. And most of our customers are really happy with um, the product we, that we sell them. Uh, the quality and consistency of your material really is how our business thrives. And that's how we keep our customer happy and that's how our business just continues to grow. So quality is the number one issue. And so that's just a brief, brief overview of what we do and um, about, about quality issues. Obviously our um, two speakers are gonna get into more detail about different types of commodities. One will be talking about post-industrial and more and then um, Stephanie will be talking about a lot of variety of, of different materials. So I wanna introduce you just to Jason first. Jason Edelson is an account executive at Maine Plastics. He joined the firm in March 2011. His overall responsibilities include buying and selling post-industrial recyclable materials domestically and internationally. This includes thermoplastics and both ferrous and non-ferrous metals. Edelson specializes in building and managing relationship-based programs with key suppliers. He also designs, coordinates, and implements recycling and landfill avoidance programs, primarily for Fortune 500 companies. Additionally, Edelson represents Maine Plastics at trade shows, speaking engagements, and marketing activities. Prior to joining Maine Plastics, Edelson spent five years as the Central Regional Director of Business Development at TransCap Trade Finance, an international purchase order and trade finance firm. Edelson holds an MBA from, with high honors in sustainable management from DePaul University's Keldstadt Graduate School of Business and a bachelor's degree in international finance from Indiana University Kelly School of Business. In his free time, he advises entrepreneurs on their new ventures, mentor students as part of the DePaul Alumni Sharing Knowledge Program, and enjoys traveling, cooking, and learning new languages. Thank you, Jason. Thank you.
thank you. Can everyone hear me? Do I need the microphone or does it help? I guess it helps a little bit. Um, first off, I want to thank ISRI for the opportunity to speak today, talking about uh, deriving value from plastic scrap. We're going to be addressing some of the quality and contamination, uh, contamination issues as it pertains to bailing, but just as an overall uh, general uh, plastics recycling practice. Before I begin, I know there's a few, it's an intimate group. How many of you are new or considering adding plastics recycling to your current metal operations? All right, so there's about half of you. How many of you have, are currently recycling plastics right now? Is it mostly, and I, by the way, I'm a very informal speaker. Is it mostly uh, C and D? Is it mostly both consumer? Both consumer, okay. Um, all right, well that said, so some of this will be review, some of this will be new. A lot of this is uh, basic principles that you already know, and maybe just it's always good to have a refresher, and it's always good to talk about. Um, and you're gonna see these common themes throughout the presentation today. The idea of uh, efficiency, uh, knowing what material you are buying and selling, being able to separate different materials, being able to maximize weight, which pretty much goes without saying, labeling the material so that when you're uh, shipping it to somebody, they know what they're getting, and being able to record what it is that you're reporting. Um, and the overall purpose of this is to maximize your return. If you're someone that's new to plastics, it's slightly different than, well, it's significantly different than metal, and that the devil is in the details. You need to know everything that you can about that plastic product that you're going to recycle, including what the next use of that product will be in order to maximize what your return is. Sometimes with certain uh, metal products, you can commingle them, set them to a smelter, and produce a product. Plastic doesn't work that way, so you need to be very specific with what it is that you are looking to recycle. So when we talk about specifics, we're talking about, if you can, find out what grade of plastic you're dealing with. It's one thing to say, I have uh, PET plastic, such as, such as this bottle. It's another thing to say, I have PET that comes from Eastman. The more information you can provide, the more valuable that material general, generally will be. Uh, knowing the grade, knowing the physical characteristics of it, and I'll have a chart in a second with a general overview of certain characteristics, but what's the melt flow? What's the IZOD? Density, barometer, color. You want to get as specifically as possible to know, A, what the application was of the original product, and again, B, what can it be reused for? As I mentioned, there's a, uh, a summary of some of the key uh, elements that goes into deciding what to know for each plastic. So for example, ABS, we want to know, which is, uh, tends to be computer housing. We've heard a lot of discussion about that. Is it uh, FR, non-FR? What's the flame retardancy on it? Um, and also, by the way, stop me if there's anything that you already know, or if you need me to repeat anything, let me know as well. I, um, be more than willing to go through it again. Other crucial facts are knowing the color of the material. Is it clear? Is it natural? Those can be the same or two different things depending on the grade of material. What condition is it in? Uh, for those that are new to plastics recycling, we look at plastics in a number of different forms. When we talk about conditions, we're talking about what is a virgin material, something coming from the original manufacturer, or something that's been repelletized, so it's in a homogeneous pellet form, or close to it, something that's a regrind, which is basically just put through a, gr uh, a grinder, comes out either in a flake form, or sometimes it looks like uh, fruity pebbles, just depends on uh, what type of uh, screen you use. We talk about uh, purging. A lot of people have come to us in the last few days asking what purging is, and how to recycle it, um, you get into film grade. It all depends. Whatever it is that you're looking to recycle, be specific as to what the grade is, or what the condition is. Also, um, how much is being generated, that goes without saying. Where is it located? How is it packaged? What we're gonna talk primarily about bailing today, but is bailing always the best opportunity, the best option for maximizing your return? 
Or is it better just to put it in Gaylord? Is it better to load it um, with pallets or without pallets? And always, how clean does it need to be? Um, plastics is very finicky. Usually it needs to be as clean as possible. Um, certain grades, depending on the color, you can get away with a little bit of dirt, but if take PET exam, um, clear PET as an example. Any trace of dirt on clear PET, and in my opinion, the value of the PET is, well, professionally I'd say it's worthless, but um, when I first started in plastics a couple years ago, my boss sat me down, and he's a big fan of sweets, and he's a big fan of the movie Forrest Gump, and he said, life is like a bale of plastic. You never know what you're going to get. Uh, and this is true, and we found out firsthand, when we receive bales and we cut bales, you never know what material you're going to find inside that bale. It might look homogenous, it might look like it's all one thing, and then you cut it open and you find out, oh, there's something else inside. And that something else can be another type of plastic, it could be cardboard, it could be shrink wrap, it can be uh, little kids' toys. You never know what you'll always find depending on who your source is. Uh, inside the bale, so it's important to be familiar with your source, where they getting their material from, again, what the application is. That way you can, A, price it effectively, and then sell it effectively. And I'll get into some examples of some contamination in a little bit. Um, the other key thing about when you're baling plastics is you don't want to mix apples and oranges. Most plastics cannot be commingled. When you go to process them, Let's say it's like baking a cake. Part of the cake will come out nice and moist and the other will be crumbly. It just doesn't, doesn't flow well and plastics don't mix. And that even leads into similar types of plastics. You might have two types of polypropylene, but if the melt flows are completely different or some of the other properties are completely different, if it's a homopolymer, or copolymer, depending on the type of polypropylene, they might not work well together. One of the key, uh, oftentimes we see nylon bales come in. And we always question, well, what type of nylon is it? And the response we get is, well, it's nylon. Well, is it nylon 6, nylon 6.6? Six, six? Is it glass filled, unfilled? We've been talking, and I'm sure there's a few people that deal with carpet recycling here, and they'll tell you that they can't handle nylon if there's glass filling in it. It's not something where they can create a fiber out of. So it's very important to know that not all nylons are the same. You know, the expression is, you know, not all family members are alike. We believe there's over 40,000 types of plastics out there. And one more. So, when it comes to qualifying plastics and getting more into the details and trying to avoid contamination, we have to find out, is the material filled or unfilled? Again, is it FR or non-FR, like computer scrap? What type of contamination is there and what's an acceptable level? Oftentimes, we've had people come up to us uh, in the last few days and say, well, I have a little bit of contamination in it. Would you take a lower price? That might be acceptable in a few applications, but in general, when it comes to plastics, if there's contamination in there, there isn't a renegotiating price. It's more of an all or nothing. We can pay you X if there's contamination in it. We can't pay you, if, or if there's no contamination in it, we can't pay you if there is contamination in it. And that includes mixed materials. And then also, uh, oftentimes we see in bales a lot of tape, metal. It, just, it all depends. One little piece of contamination, whatever it is, a harmless rubber band, and you can lose the, the value of, a, of a plastic. The other thing is keeping colors separated. Um, it's very important when it comes to plastics to know your colors and your hierarchy. So for instance, at the top of the hierarchy, we have clear or natural material, followed by white or black, mixed colors that go black, and mixed color colors that won't go black. So for example, yellow is a color that won't typically go black. Why is it important? Why do you need to know this? Because what's the next application going to be? The more universal you could be, the more valuable your, your material will be. So again, be specific. I, I threw this slide in here last minute, uh, again, just to address some of the questions we've had about purging. And is it better to purge or, or not purge, better to grind? Do you bail the purge? 
you put it in loosely in Gaylords, what's the best way to package it and market it? And you know, the, the answer is it all depends on the type of purge, um, what the grade of the purge is, what, what was it being used for? Is this a transition purge where you're switching out from one material to another material? You have to, is it a color, is it a color transition? You need to identify what the difference is. If it's two different materials, the value of that purge, in my opinion, is generally going to be less. If it's a, simply a color transition, well, can you take those colors black? What colors can you take them? In that case, um, it may be worth it just to grind as opposed to bale it. Um, and then again, is there any compounding? Is there any additives put into it? Label it. Uh, as far as regrind goes, some people say, well, what if, we, what if we were to regrind it for you instead of bale it? I said, that's okay, except for that you have to have a dedicated grinder and you have to make sure that you clean your grinder, which be prepared to take three to four hours to clean it. And you have to look at what your overhead costs are to run the grinder. And then again, it's always important to label the materials. You can't have PET and PVC in the same grinder without cleaning them out. Um, as far as baling and uh, how, you, how to package it, well, if you're typical baling, let's say you're baling loose parts, you want to make sure that it's wrapped. You want to make sure that there's cardboard generally to bookend the, the bales and help keep them together. Make sure that they're tight. If you're baling regrind or flake, to avoid contamination, you want to sometimes put a cover on top of it, maybe put some cardboard on top of it or try to surround it as best as you can to avoid contamination from getting in there. And then you have to find out from your customers if they want them on skids. Stephanie will mention exporting, and if you're exporting, you're probably going to want heat-treated skids. So as you all know, um, when it comes to weight, the old expression of uh, time equals money, well, it's really weight equals money as well. We typically want bales that are about 1,000 pounds, give or take, depending on the type of product. Um, sometimes we'll get bales, people will bale something and you'll say, it's, oh, it's two, 300 pounds. And you wonder what type of cost went into making that bale, having to rebale it and reprocess it. Uh, also, when you're making your bales, it's important to consider, can you double stack it? If it's a loose fitting bale, is it going to stack or is everything going to fall apart? Um, and again, depending on the, the recycler you work with, some will take partial loads, some want full loads. We all know it's important to maximize weight. But whatever, regardless of what you're shipping, please identify it. Please provide, please provide a list. Why is it important to identify what you're sending somebody? Um, when Jonathan called me up to ask me to present on this and say, well, can you tell me about some contamination issues? Can you tell me about effective bailing? I said, yeah, you mean like what happens when you uh, bail drums that are supposed to be clean that happen to have had uh, vinegar in them or caustic soda at one point, but they've been promised to be triple rinsed? And he said, yeah, something like that. I go, oh, so, okay, so when you bail drums that had vinegar in them and caustic soda together in the same bale, you create acid. I, I didn't know that until uh, we did that. I was thinking vinegar, oil, salad dressing, no problem. Uh, this is one of my learning horrors. Um, so when that happens, when that happens, it creates a chemical reaction. I don't know, those, our lights are very euphoric in our plant. It's hard to see, but we had a big white cloud throughout the plant. And when there's a big white cloud throughout the plant that's causing people's eyes to itch and throats to itch, you have to cancel a shift. So it's very, very important to label your material and know what you're buying and selling to avoid such catastrophes from happening. You know, drums are supposed to be triple rinsed. They're supposed to be properly emptied. There might be some residue. OSHA allows up to an inch of uh, liquid in the bottom of it, but you need to know what it is. They need to be metal and rubber free, again, from a contamination standpoint, and they need to be labeled. Good drum bales, just to give you an example, look like this. Uh, unfortunately, our, our mishap didn't look like that. Uh, a few other do's and don'ts, um, since we're in Orlando and you're universal, kind of one with the, the film idea. Here's an example of a bad bale we got in. It, uh, you can sort of see on there, it says needs more weight, and they're about 300 pounds. 
and you sit there and say, who would take the time to bail something like this, put the, the manpower into it, wrap it up, and only do 300 pounds? You know, a great film bale should look like something like this, where you have about 1,500, 1,900 pounds to bale, something that's weighty, it's properly secured, it's got proper ties, proper shrink wrap around it, proper cardboard. And how would you rate this film? I, mean, I look at this and I see a number of problems. I, I see a very loosely put together bale. I see part, obviously the plastic's falling apart. I don't see really any cardboard. It's not shrink wrap. It looks a little light to me. These are all things to consider when you're looking at maximizing your return when it comes to bailing. Here's an example of a computer scrap bale that we got in. And it's a little bit difficult to see, I apologize, but that shiny reflective material, that's metal. Um, Stephanie's gonna talk about uh, exporting to China a little bit and she'll tell you metal is a no-no. We don't wanna see bales with metal in it. We want the plastic. Now here's a, a better example of what a good ABS bale should look like. It's uh, metal free to the best that it can be. It's a uh, nice big weight, about a thousand pounds. And it's primarily made of plastics. If you look at this bale, and it's hard to see from this picture, but it looks like it's a decent bale. It's got the shrink wrap, it's got the cardboard. But I look at this as a wasted opportunity to make money because what this is is a bale of different grades of engineered plastic. If someone had properly sorted the plastic out, the product could have been reground, which in my opinion would be more valuable than baling it. And instead now it's gonna take a lot of labor to cut that bale and sort that material. So in conclusion, how to make a good bale. Again, it comes back to specifically identifying the material. Get as specific as possible. The devil's in the details. Make it tight. Make sure the bales are tight. The only exception to that is if you're baling like a polyurethane foam or some form of uh, material that has a bit of a memory to it. If you bale it too tight, you run the risk of the wire snapping, which could cause an accident. Make sure you're pr properly protecting the material from contamination, such as OCC, by wrapping it with OCC and shrink wrap. And of course, make it heavy. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Now I want to introduce you to Stephanie Lam. Stephanie is a managing director of UNM International, one of Asia's largest and most active brokers in recyclable plastics industry. UNM International grew from a small family-based cottage industry-sized business into one of the most prominent players in the market. Fueled by Stephanie's enthusiasm and determination to succeed, Stephanie trades hundreds of thousands of tons of recyclable plastics from various countries all over the world. Stephanie is a real industry professional with wealth of experience in plastic scraps trading. She developed her company into one of the most trusted and respected brokers in the industry. Thank Smarty for your kind introduction, and also thanks Isri and Jonathan for inviting me to give me an opportunity to share my experience on the stage with you. Before I start my presentation, allow me to introduce my company. My company, UNM International Limited, is a family started business based in Hong Kong 20 years ago. Um, in, uh, we started in uh, custom clearance and logistics. And in 2008, I started the international trading um, from all over the world. And we are ISO 9001 and ISO 4001 accredited company. And we are also an AQSIQ accredited exporter to China. Over the years, we trade uh, quite a lot of di different material from all over the world. Covering Canada, USA, Mexico, UK, Europe, Middle East, Australia, China, and also Southeast Asia. What we do here is mainly PET, HDPE, LDPE, PP, PS, mixed bottle, all sorts of different grades is uh, some example. 
year. So today I'm going to um, share, share with you some perspective from an importer um, or end user about these kind of items covering electronics casing, LVP flame, HDP bottom regrind, uh, Comango mix bottle, and also rigid plastics. And uh, we'll also give you some update about the green pass action that recently took in, in China. So this is what we're doing over there in the facilities, um, that we do everything by hand and sort different polymer and different color into different basket. It's all hand sorted. So about the electronics that um, usually they have different grades of electronics generated like uh, electronic casing, fridge plastic, we, etc. Due to the time limitation, I'll pick out the electronic casing to share with you today. So most of these materials, they're coming out from computers, monitors, TV, printers, photocopy machine, home appliances, mobile phone, etc. And this material, they're made out of uh, ABS, PS, PC ABS, all sorts of things like this. And um, customer always come back and ask us uh, these kind of questions like, what color ratio it is in a container between black and white or mixed color, and the proportion of ABS, PC ABS, and, and AB, uh, PS, and whether they belt separately or belt together, and then the source of electronics, whether it's coming out from computers or a TV or photocopy machine, printers, etc., and also about the loading weight. So why they have all this concern, basically, um, in China, after we sort it into different item, they will, I mean, this kind of material, they have different market price, so they just want to have a better idea on what the material is like and then so that they can have better accurate um, valuation when they buy the material so that they, on the other side, will also help to avoid some problems on claim if they say, like, they're selling ABS and then come with, like, PC ABS, then they will come back with a problem. So we have some bells like this in the market available, um, like ABS bell on the left hand side is mainly like computer casing and uh, some strata electronic housing in the middle and then a TV and computer casing, they're mixed together in the bell. Um, the price between like the difference between the ABS and the uh, TV and computer bells that over there in China, it could be go up to US dollar, $200 per, uh, per ton difference if you, we mis, um, market it to the customer so that if we sell like um, ABS and then come back, we have uh, some mixed printers or TV monitors, uh, uh, bells, material in the bell, then uh, the customer will probably come back with a claim to some kind of market. So for this, uh, Computer casing, uh, electronic casing is very sensitive to move at the moment. Um, if you guys are in the electronics recycling with this kind of casing or stratted um, housing coming out, uh, you're definitely facing a tough market at the moment because uh, actually over there in China, they, we, we have a very strong demand inside China. But the problem is getting through the customs that put a very straight uh, standard out there Definitely circuit board is not allowed if they see any piece of circuit board when they inspecting the container, definitely the whole container will get rejected. And then no matter the way that, uh, how straight they inspecting the material is like, if you get, if they find even one screw um, in the container, that's metal. And then they will also reject the whole container. So who else can, you know, can guarantee that you don't have a single screw in the container? But, uh, but most of them, I, th I believe they would say, oh, well, we got like 99% removed it, but the other 1% were causing the problem because they're, they're going through x-ray machine to check those metal in the container, so there's no way to cheat on this uh, 1%. For the loading weights of this kind of casing, that um, it doesn't come as heavier as other material that usually come with like 40 to 14 to 18 metric tons. Um, something like that, and uh, we don't suggest to go too hard uh, to put too much weight into a container in the bell because this kind of uh, material, they are very bristle, 
very easy to break when you press too hard they will break this kind of casing into very small pieces that will take more time for the end user to sort in these kind of small pieces that will create trouble. So just, I mean, heavier enough to go export, that would be good. So this is a container that um, was filled with ABS casing that I bought from Middle East. And uh, it's pretty good color in there, you know, all white color. And then uh, what the problem is, what I got here is um, they're losing, loading the container in a loose. So this is something that I supposed to get like in bell and in bag. And then I come back to the, my supplier and say, hey, look, how come the container is loaded like that? Is that, oh, well, I told you that it's going to be some in bell and some to be shredded. But I didn't tell you that it's going to be all in uh, bags. So they load me a container with a loose that, I mean, we still can clear custom about that. but. Um, Nowadays, uh, custom, they put in very strict uh, standard or problem or whatever. The loose container will definitely make that more difficult um, to check. And then, uh, then customer will very hesitate to move anything that doesn't keep the custom clearance agent happy. So that if possible, put it in the bags will definitely help a little bit in marketing your material. So LDPE flame. Uh, Usually material coming out from supermarket, um, MRF or agricultural or post-consumer you know, collections. And um, these kind of things, uh, we have a question to go through from, uh, with, from our customer. Um, first question definitely come with color, whether uh, this, uh, how many percentage of natural in there, uh, color, color in there. In the market, that probably is more popular in the other country that uh, we would you would talk about some terms that I'm not, I'm not sure whether you heard about before. We talk about like the, per, uh, the percentage of the color of the flame. We call it like 100%, 99.1, 98.2, 95.5, 90.10, 80.20, 80.30, 80.40, 80.50, 80.60, 80.70, 80.80, 80.90, 80.90, 80.90, 80.90, 80.90, 80.90, 80.90, 80.90,
some concern, but uh, it depends. All depends on the price that they're buying and you're selling, because they have to take out all these kind of things before they process the material. Particularly grocery bags, it's a very big concern at the moment. If uh, the uh, flame come with grocery bags and then uh, getting through customs will, will be also a problem that uh, have a very high chance to be rejected. So if you possible to keep uh, grocery bags out, that would be easier to move in container into China at the moment. So, um, I came across with some um, recently uh, LDP flame that they look very good color, all natural from outside, and uh, just burn it. They would turn it into black. Have no idea what's going on there, and then uh, it's just turned black. And I have some people check it on as LDPE, but I mean these things like that that happen in the market, but it's uh, unavoidable. That's some something to pay attention to. So maybe I mean these are some quick tricks that we do over China. Just try to have a burn it and then see what the color coming out. So anything turned black, definitely telling you something that is not pure in there, but I mean, what's in there, that will be it. You know, take some time to find out. Where does that film come from? Where is that? Uh, this kind of flame? Yes. Or th this kind of flame will be coming out from uh, like supermarket collection. That uh, these pictures, I think I probably pick it out from some UK facilities and stuff from America, but I mean, more or less, they look the same like this. So for HDPE, um, we talk about like Milljax HDP bell bottle, HDP uh, the natural one, the color one, and also the regrind. Um, in America, the HDPE natural bottle is pretty standard, mainly Milljax. But if you if you guys are dealing with Mexico bottle that we have uh, some con little concern from some customer that about um, some natural belt that we have some uh, smaller bottle like a yogurt bottle, a uh, smaller one. They come with a big a label outside that uh, they said is PVC label. So they have to do it like uh, by hand to take it out even though, I mean, you can do it in flow sink, but that's what they do, they cut it off. So they don't, if they see a bottle like this, it's not welcome into the natural bell. So, I mean, uh, we, we pay lower value for, for those uh, kind of bell as well. For some customer, they have a concern, but some they may not have concern. So the picture on the right, uh, top right-hand corner is the Mexico HDP bell. The American quality is pretty good, pretty standard. I'm not going to cover that, but the concern we have uh, is uh, more on the uh, Mexico bottle. There is some uh, green bottle or I don't know how you name it, um, bottle out there, that more green, blue. Um, they are uh, filled up with uh, additives, so probably calcium carbonate. And then if we cut, uh, chop into uh, regrind, into flakes, put it in the water, this kind of color will sink, that will cause problem, but, but not like all the color will sink, because I try to take a picture of uh, the sample that I got in the office, but not really, not all of them are sinking, but I mean, when they see the color like that in the bell, it was definitely causing concern to them. And um, the washed and unwashed regrind definitely right now, unwashed things is no-no to get into China. So, I mean, uh, we need some more washed material over there. And um, the trend for uh, China, uh, definitely we, we need more clean stuff and process of stuff in the long term to getting into the country. So Comango 127, mixed bottle 442, these are all the names that people are using in the market. It's basically talking about Comango plastics come with bottle. So uh, some operation, they will take out um, HDP milk, uh, milk bottle or color bottle and then the rest living there, they call it like still one to seven. And some people, they took, uh, like, uh, uh, took out H a PET bottle out, they would call it maybe two to seven, things like that. And uh, some people, they would take out HDPE, that bottle, and then PET bottle out, they still name it as one to seven. And then, uh, or some will probably still name it as a uh, mixed bottle when they took the bottle out. So these kind of terms are pretty confusing in the market that uh, usually we also have to understand what the process uh, was being done before and when we buy the material. 
So there's some example of the mixed model that on the left hand side that uh, without taking out the HDP um, and also PD model. And at the right hand side, I mean, uh, that we call, some people call one to seven. Um, usually it's a, a little bit lower grade, uh, less content of the HDP or PET bottle, but it all depends on the name. I mean, we all differentiate it from pictures. So here's some concern that when we deal with some post-consumer material that coming out from the MRF glass is definitely a big problem uh, because as I showed before, that what we do over there, we do uh, manual sorting and we doesn't come with trammel over there to remove glass uh, from this kind of bell. So when we have to get uh, the worker to work on this bell with glass contamination, they have very, very reluctant to process this kind of material. And also glass is very heavy item, highly contaminated um, into the bell. It's definitely very difficult to get through customs. So it's better to keep it out as much as possible. And trace on the left hand side, um, this is coming from like, um, we call it also find from like mixed bottle, but we come, we find this kind of item, material come with a lot of trays in there. So trays, even though this like PET or PP trays in there, when people then buy mixed bottle, they don't like to see much trays in there because um, the value for PET and HDPE bottle is definitely higher than those trays because trays are, even though for PET, we go for some lower end application. So there's something that we're concerned about. And then a the metal, the tin can is a, mostly the one come with problem. Um, tin can is like, doesn't look much or big uh, from outside in the bell, but when there is some in there, the weight is very <coughs> heavy and uh, it contributes to a quite significant amount of the weight itself. So that's why that's uh, causing a problem to us. And then the tin can is also a lower value than the HDP and PET bottle as well. So top right hand corner is a belt of uh, paper that we can find in some container that with whole belt of uh, paper coming in or um, usually we also find some like paper in some bale that, uh, in the plastics. Paper is a very big concern to plastic recycler because uh, the duty, custom duty for plastics uh, into China is free. Uh, so, uh, but for plastics getting in there, uh, it costing over around 1,500 RMB per ton. So that's why, um, you know, the amount that we have to pay for this kind of mat material that we shouldn't pay for value, um, duty for, and then uh, the ratio that we deducted on the, on the claim of the, uh, it's not just um, the, the ratio of the uh, percentage of paper itself, also for the handling cost, duty, these kind of things also draw into concern. And the next uh, picture is at the bottom, is uh, some juice bottle that uh, is a big no-no as well that we can recycle over there, uh, particular for, I would say, plastic recycler. So the rest of it is just showing you some kind of trash that we can find in the bell. That uh, trash is pretty obvious. It's not recyclable and definitely causing problems. So, so we just need some more quality bells. Rigid plastic that uh, we have a couple of speaker cover this item before. So I'm going to have a quick insight on what we look at over there. So as um. This kind of rigid bell that are usually uh, coming from like injection or a bromoding grade of HDPE and PP that will make up the value of the bell. And um, <coughs> bigger piece, there yeah, is the more welcome because we saw it by hand. If anything smaller size than a, like a, a palm size is kind of considered to be a wastage or lost to the recycler over there. And the pipe here that um, even though some pipe they come with HDPE that with pretty good value in there, and also some of the pipe in the market they are PVC. So uh, some of your process they may pick out PVC pipe, but uh, from a buyer perspective, a lot of people out there they don't pick out the PVC pipe in there. So they just put PVC pipe and HDP pipe into the bell. When when buyer look at the bells sewing the pipe, even though you know there's the HDPE pipe in there but they were definitely thinking there's PVC pipe in there instead of HDP pipe in there. So PVC is uh, definitely causing problem so that will uh, lower the value of the material. So if possible that um, if you can bring the, uh, the 
pipe out and belt it separate as like HDPE pipe, then you'll get better value for it instead of putting it in the rigid. And also the color that we prefer, like not prefer, we don't have much option there, but we we'll definitely look at the, the color of the, the bell to give out the, uh, the number of the price because uh, the lighter color definitely get high price. I believe it's the same in America as well. So the regulations update that uh, I believe that a lot of you know what's going on over there in China. So the green fence action um, is what we are all talking about. It's a 10 months long nationwide uh, initiative taken by China Customs aimed to protect the environment by preventing importation of solid waste contaminated shipment kicked off in 1st of February. So pay attention to this is this is uh, kick, uh, taken by China Customs, nothing with AQSIQ or whatever CCIC that you're dealing with. And what the problem is right now, the shipment getting through over there, that would probably get a CCIC certificate on it. And then, uh, but you get through the, the CCIC inspection in China at the port, and then uh, that would probably get rejected by the customs over there. So that's, uh, that's the things that's causing problem over there. They're kind of still negotiating the way that they're doing. The main focus of the action is kind of focusing on the mining scrap, tire scrap, batteries, electronics, textile, construction waste, household waste, medical waste, etc. So plastic's not really kind of a big, you know, things that they have to try to reject. But the thing is, I mean, it's easily fall down into household waste or medical waste when, while you don't know what materials in there, and uh, you know, so if they break the bell, see something, oh, grocery bags, oh, there's a screw in there, oh, so they would just maybe reject the container. That's what it is. So um, at the on the other side, they're not just uh, checking the container at the port. They also crack down on the misdecoration, um, smuggling, and also transfer license on the illegal importation of the controlled waste. In the other words, that uh, that means they're getting down really to the factories to check out the factories as well, see whether they import the material and then they process the material there or they just sell it to someone else. But there's a very popular common uh, practice in the China, but now it's a very, very difficult and problem that uh, they really implementing this kind of rule that they set out earlier. So what they're going do, uh, doing over there is uh, the container being inspected by, they call H986, non-invasion inspection. In the other words, we call it X-ray here. The whole container just get through a dock and then they will see what material is in there or if there's any metal that coming out that would definitely, you know, in the plastics, they would definitely get rejected. So. Uh, the, the electronic casing getting a very difficult time in uh, sending into China, but while the, on the other side, we have very high demand over there for this kind of material. So um, some part that they are implementing, they call 100% inspection, 100% um, waste scale, and also 100% radiation inspection for metal scrap. And uh, because some um, in the old days, maybe people well, they put different weight or whatever, if you come, um, we come across with some container that have one ton shortage, that uh, on the scale on the customs that they will come back, uh, hey, well, how come you got problem with like the one ton shortage? So, so for us, we don't really know what's going on there. The way that we got from a supplier that uh, is what we put on to the you know, decoration, but, uh, but uh, these kind of things, we catch the attention on this uh, weight. As I said, site inspection for importer and, um, and reprocessor is going on, and uh, it's getting very nervous. I mean, uh, in the market at the moment, and the people because the the custom people they kind of uh, standing outside of the factory to see the material coming in and going out that's going on in China. And for those that arrive the container, if they're not allowed it to be imported to China, that I mean, if you have a hesitation, you know, while you have uh, some material going on there. If you want to redivert it to the uh, to the other port or whatever destination, you have to do it before it's arriving to the port. If anything's get arrived, it there's uh, no chance to divert it at the moment without getting approval from the custom. And then uh, I heard there's a lot of container get stuck over there that are waiting to be redivert or some further instructions from the China customs. 
And um, if uh, any other any item that they found is uh, considered to be illegal import, and uh, they reject the container, and then a uh, container have to return to be to their origin. Some container already did, but there's still a lot of containers sitting there waiting for further instructions as well. So I believe that you heard a lot about the what's going on about the green fence action by words or you know, news, and um, I found a video of a news that uh, from uh, SETV, that's one of the TV channel from uh, in Fujian province that on March 1st, they're talking about uh, the green fence action as in uh, Canton, uh, Mandarin, actually, I don't know, I don't think that you can understand, but it's uh, just a one minute video that to show you what's really going on over there and, uh, you, and I'll explain to you after the video. <laughs> Oh, maybe, if, okay. Before I go to that video first, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more what's going on over there that it got rejected. Um, that's all in a China Customs website, but they may, I mainly find it on the Chinese version. I couldn't find anything in the English version. So um, that's uh, the news out there that uh, on April 7th, that uh, over 200 metric tons of the plastic strip and rubber being rejected from a port of uh, Huangdao, one of the port in Qingdao, and uh, they're worth uh, 2.2 million women beef material and then another part in Jiaxing that also finds some wrongly declared waste paper by the X-ray machine as well. So um, at the other part, they also reject like 40 ton of PP scrap imported into Shanto. And um, there's a company in Shanto being caught by custom by importing over 3,000, almost 400 metric tons of material of plastic scrap in there and then with that process it and then send it to another factories that being caught by customs as well. But I believe that the number of these kind of problems that's a way over of what is being found on internet there. Okay, so here's the video. I'm not sure. Couldn't be play here. Maybe have some problem. No. Okay, it's a bit of shame that it doesn't go come up. What I'm trying to tell you in this video is um, there's a link that I can send you. The link that you can check it out on the internet. <coughs> there um, is a uh, talking about some people they're breaking how they uh, inspecting the container at the pot over there. And uh, you can see there are a couple of guys, they're doing, they're standing there from the different department, environmental department, uh, customs, and the AQS, IQ, things like that, to check the container. So the container now has to go through different departments instead of just going through CCIC, not that easy. And then uh, they break the bells, um, and some container, they're breaking every single bell at the port to see what materials it's spelled in there. And then after that, they just load the container as loose, bring it back, and for whatever couldn't bring it back into the container is considered as a lost for a customer. And uh, so uh, there's very tough inspection going on over there. I just came across with an experience with uh, one container I shipped it over um, to a customer in the port in Tianjin, and uh, that's supposed to be an LDP flame that collected from some supermarket. and. Uh, this looks all right from outside, and then, uh, and then I come back with the news. They said that the container get being rejected. And we are very shocked about what what's going on. What what they get rejected, and then after that they come back because they break the bells, and then they find there's some like probably medical bottle, the pill bottle in there, and also with the pills that I mean this kind of material they didn't pick it out. So that put in a bell, you couldn't look from outside, and then they break everything, and then they check these kind of things, and then they definitely reject the container. So that's how strict is going on over there in China. So in general, if we want to make the industry more sustainable, we have to increase the quality of the scrap, and uh, try to keep as much as, uh, you know, different polymer or source as separate as possible uh, when you're doing processing and also understanding the contamination of the scrap and also your customer capability will definitely help in marketing your material. And as a customer, and we are more than happy to pay more to buy more quality scrap out there. So here is my contact. If you have any questions, that feel free to ask in the Q&A section or drop me an email. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Stephanie. So I wanted to take some questions. I'll, I'll start with one, actually. Um, Stephanie, how, how long do you think the green fence will last? I know you said 10 months, but um, I know everyone here is November. Do you think that's going to happen? or? Well, uh, the 10 months is kind of an official uh, program they kind of uh, announced. And uh, this, kind of, this action doesn't look like will come to an end in the near future because uh, it's uh, every day we heard from the market, it's like getting more and more serious of what the action is taking on, going on in different provinces as well. Because uh, I, I just uh, simply do some quick search on the internet, but it's mostly come with our Chinese news. And uh, there's a lot of news regarding this action in March that uh, mainly talking about all different parts they, uh, they started uh, the green fence action and then getting into implementation, things like that. So I believe that it's getting more and more serious in this matter. And the whole project, uh, the official day is going to be concluded and in December 15, something like that. So it doesn't look like that would come to an end in the near future. So if they say it's not November, something like that, that's all the information that we can get from the market. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, and Jason, what's the biggest challenge for someone uh, wanting to expand their metal scrap business and to include plastics? Uh, I think plastics in general is a whole different language. It's um, learning an entirely new product. It's one of those um, questions I've been asked a lot the last few days. And the advice I've given has really been to know just enough to be dangerous. Try not to, to major in minors, if you will. Um, you really stick to the basics, know what you're buying, find out, as Stephanie said, I think over and over and over again, what's the contamination in there? What is it that you're actually looking to process? What is it that, as we're focusing here today on bailing, what is it that you're actually looking to bail? What are your, what are your costs to bail? What's your overhead? If you're gonna get into the industry, what are your overhead costs going to be, your startup cost, and really find out what the market is about, is it worth the return, or is it better to know what materials are, what's available, what the low-hanging fruit is, so to speak, and to partner up with recyclers such and, and go that route. Great, thanks. Does anyone have questions? Yes? I guess for both of you, how have you seen the single stream development in the United States uh, affect the plastic market? Do you have recommendations for single stream processors on uh, certain segments of the market that offer greater opportunities than others? Do you want to start with that? Or uh, that's very technical in the domestic recycling perspective, but I need okay. a question for you. All right. Um, single stream has definitely gotten a lot more attention. Um, what you're seeing, the, mostly what we're seeing are um, MRFs or the local municipalities really starting to push it and to improve their recycling program. Um, this will sound a little bit uh, snarky, but part of the reason why they push that is also because they can charge for it as well. So they look to partner up with someone, charge you as part of your taxes to, to recycle it, and then be able to then sell that material once they collect it to a single stream uh, recycler. So as far as the opportunities go, I, I see opportunities mostly in pairing up with municipalities or um, large venues as um, cities. I, I know as I was flying out here, there was a big promo in O'Hare Airport about the Chicago aviation going green. So you see a lot of airports um, trying to go single stream. Uh, I hope I'm answering your questions as far as like locations and, and opportunities. Um, really where you ever you have a large mass of people but you can can sort of limit the number of materials coming through if that makes any sense i think my question was a little bit more on specific materials within that oh uh then in that case bottles uh mostly pet bottles hdp bottles um Really, I mean, from a, from a single stream standpoint, those are the most that you see. A lot of people are focused on uh, ones and twos. If you want to look at the, the recycling numbers, you'll see some dip, people dipping into the fours, which is HDP, and the fives now, which is a polypropylene. That's becoming more prevalent. Um, 
you don't really see people focusing on some of the sevens, uh, although here in this show we've seen a lot of people focus on uh, computer scrap, which would be the ABSs, the PCs, but in general, out there, you're not seeing a lot of um, one-off PC uh, polycarbonate transactions. And, and PVC is really, people are trying to push the PVC market, but PVC is sort of a difficult animal, so it's really on the, on the lower end. Does that answer your question a little bit better? Okay, thank you. Yes. I have a question about, um, it's been mentioned a couple times the last couple of days that Coke has come up with this different manufacturing process for a bottle that put it in with the other soda bottles that really messes things up. You're talking about the plant-based? Yes. And so how do you avoid throwing all that, those two things together? Is there some... Well... There are ways to test plastic, and we didn't really get into that today. Uh, probably the crudest way, unfortunately, is to burn the material. Oh, sorry, I'm not allowed to talk about that. Uh, I apologize, strike that. Um, how do you avoid them from getting mixed? If you're looking at post-consumer, see if there's a number on them. Um, if it's a PET bottle, it'll have a number one. If it's an other, it'll have a number seven on it. Um, They'll have a number one on it They're on okay. the Coke. They're okay, though. Uh, I'm not super versed in the Coke bottles, but if you're looking at general uh, PET versus a PLA, which is one of the popular ones out there, or PSM, which is another pos uh, popular starch-based uh, container, um, plastic, the, they should either have a seven on it or they'll, be they'll usually be labeled seven, and they'll say PLA or seven PSM on it. So then that's where you can differentiate it. Can I talk about just touch and textures and all as well. Okay, so you can look at it sometimes and see the clarity. There might be a slight clarity difference. There might be a slight feel difference to the material. That's something that you just kind of have to learn and be taught. But those, those are other ways to identify it and what the true natural color is. Any other questions? Yeah, I have two more. Or you can have one, yeah, go ahead. Jonathan. You want my honest answer? Zero. <laughs> so here, because you couldn't even get through customs. And also, I mean, uh, with this kind of material, there's the magnet you can you would put into, I would say, mixed rigid plastic belt. And uh, this kind of item that is uh, the main market is going to China. And then China, they doesn't allow any metal in their plastics. And it's very, very difficult at the moment. They would try to look for different home for this kind of material that wasn't quite successful at the moment. So we better play with the rules, try to take it off as much as possible. To, to, to give you a nut and bolt answer on that, the reasoning why, we want you to take it off. Because if it's an HTP bucket, we're gonna put it through a shredder to break it down and then through a grinder. So it'll be a regrind so that we could sell that as a reusable material when there's metal in there. Obviously, if you're putting it through a grinder, which is a giant paper shredder, it's going to uh, can break the blades. It's going to affect the, the quality of the product. And if you are successful in chopping down the metal, and you go to try to reprocess that or try to make another application with it, you're going to have metal contamination, which means your product's going to be defective and not come out the way you want it to. I just wanted to add, actually, one thing to that, yeah. um, because I'm, I'm working with with Jonathan uh, and uh, Isri and APR are coming up with specs, and one of them is about the bulky rigid. Um, and what it seems to be domestically that the market is accepting kind of the metal hangers, but not the axle rods that come through, because that's what really jams up the systems. What do you think of that? I think it really depends on what type of machine you got mm. and the horsepower and what type of metal sorter you have. Right. Um, you know, you, I'm sure you know all about eddy currents and, and different types of uh, separating processes. Okay. Yes. That was going to be my comment as I represent an electronics recycling facility and we've been dealing with a couple of export vendors who have said that it's okay to leave the metal handles on our bulk ridges or if you get a trash can it's got the, the rod, the, you know, the wheel rod that goes through there, that's okay. We've gotten mixed reviews, but 
we have had them say it's okay. And so to hear that that wouldn't get through customs, I mean, that's a fear. We would never want a container to come back. So how do you get, how do you choose who's telling you what's right and who's telling you what's wrong? Actually, what's uh, happening over there right now is, uh, well, I mean, our, we can process it, this material. We can handle it in the market. We have the labor to do that. But the thing is that uh, what uh, makes the market very volatile at the moment is uh, you never know what the policy is going to be enforced tomorrow. So, um, I mean, we can do that. But, I mean, the thing is uh, if you couldn't get through the customs, so, I mean, uh, there's uh, just, a sh you know, there's nothing. And uh, this kind of rules keep changing every day. And I was buying, um, I was in a kind of almost closing a deal uh, on a container of, like, PP bumper that uh, kind of uh, regrind and then uh, the supplier can get the CCIC before uh, shipping to China. No metal on there and then there's some a little bit third but I mean they can get the CCIC before and then this morning I come back with uh, the agent, custom clearance agent tell me that oh if you haven't shipped the material better don't ship because recently this week they're rejecting container with similar problems. So I mean uh, it's just the problem is they keep changing the rules so we just have to play with it. It's amazing, one week, literally, the yeah. same CCI agent will come and say, pass. The next week, same exact material, same supplier, same stream. I'm sorry, but we can't accept this. Yeah, I mean, the thing is now they have to go through a different department and they have different standard. This makes the trouble right now over there. And uh, I also, uh, when I do the research for my speech and I also find some uh, company from Europe that's shipping waste paper that with CCI certification and then got caught in the custom as well. So this is what's happening right now. I, I think if you, if you have a supplier who's willing to take it, that's wonderful. I think it's always good to have alternatives. What he's, he or she's probably doing is chopping it in some way and cutting it off loosely, and he somehow can manage his labor costs to do so. That or he might be taking it elsewhere, export-wise. Yes. For uh, Stephanie, you, you mentioned um, when containers get stopped, Well, the information that I got back is because the container is being confirmed, has to be re rejected, but uh, we're still waiting for further for uh, for um, instructions from the customs how we can handle that, but definitely we have to leave China for that container. Mm -hmm. And um, for those container, there's some container that kind of arrived, and then it just cannot be re-exported. I mean, uh, even though you, I mean, you deal with the shipping line, I mean, it's just the law over there. I mean, they just don't allow you to go. Does that mean they won't, I mean, I've seen containers go and they're staying and they won't come back. Or probably they're sitting there or they're not really coming back. Maybe they go to a different country or whatever, but it depends on whether the, the custom allowed you to do that. But the thing is, we have the container that confirmed being rejected, just sitting there and then waiting for the instructions, just waiting. And I, my understanding is that could take a long time yeah, before it would you take get a, a response. Time. Yeah, which obviously and it costs cost. money to stay yeah. there every day, yeah. right? Yeah. Right. Well, eventually it's going to be a shortage of containers. So yep, definitely. Shut everything down. Yep. Do you think the customer on the other end will ever get a whole, like, say November, like, say they keep them there until November, and then finally the customer can get them? Is that possible? Well, I, I will have a question over that because uh, uh, until that stage, uh, I don't know how much cost is going to be incurred. Uh, at that point, and then the value of the material, whether it's worth them to pay extra money to get a container out is the questions, because there's a lot of container that being abandoned uh, is some different part due to a similar situation like that, because they couldn't clear custom, they just, customer just simply walk away, and then I, I have to take care for some of my supplier, whatever container that they seek for help for a situation like that, but yeah. Okay. Like Any other questions? <laughs> Okay, I wanted to thank everyone for being here and please give a round of applause to our speakers. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.